Additional Background Section 1 Armageddon Rising the rise of the Armageddon Imperium is one of the most important events of the 10,000 years following the Second Age of Strife, and is a truly inspiring tale. However, the story begins within the darkest period of the troubled world of Armageddon's history. As it had always been, the polluted hive world had been a site of sporadic warfare during the collapse of the Imperium. On the eve of M51, the world's population found itself speared between three dreadful and relentless foes. The Kazan Imperium. A culture of men driven to madness and narcotic indulgences, filled the system with their narc barges and gunships, pounding and assaulting the worlds of the system relentlessly, pillaging the supplies of the beleaguered realm in order to create more drugs to ship back to their crazed populace. The second foe was the Rand, an imperium of rebellious abhumans and mutant freaks, who wished to annex the hive world and steal the world's military manufacturing capabilities for their own ends. Wild beastmen hordes and serfogrins were common amongst the armies of the Rand, who butchered and performed the cruelest of acts upon the cowering people. Not only did these imperiums relentlessly assault the planets, a far worse force was drawn to the center of battle, and the opportunity for sadism. A warband of the Emperor's children, which dragged a dozen enslaved chaos warbands in their wake as they burst from the warp to partake in the debauchery and torment such a war offered the chaos twisted superhumans. The Steel Legion and the Hiver militias tried their best to hold off these forces, but there was never any real hope. Slowly, over almost three years of horrendous, murderous firefights and blood-drenched desperate struggles in the dirt and rubble of Armageddon's countless smashed hive spires and ruined homes, bodies were piled high in the streets. The pavements and pathways ran a dull black red, the taint of congealing blood filling every nostril. The Emperor's children bestrode the battlefields like malevolent gods. Their noise marines deafened and liquidized fleeing remnants of humanity, while other deranged elements of the twisted monsters stalked men through the streets like animals. Before putting them down with fitful giggles, pulling out eyes while men flailed uselessly against them, many dark legends began to form amongst the despairing populace, some fair, some ill. Across every world of the Armageddon system, one name was spoken with quivering, fearful whispers. The Eternal One, Lucius. Lucius the Eternal was a nightmare by this period, a towering giant covered in the screaming faces of those slain by the Eternal Beast's blades, or subverted by his blessing. He traveled from world to world, challenging and murdering the greatest heroes and leaders of the near-broken defenders. Over the 20,000 years of his vile existence, Lucius' body had stretched beyond his natural physique. His body expanding to accommodate the hundreds upon thousands of agonized faces bound within his accursed battle plate. His lash whipped about him like a viper, slaying men and women with every venomous, languid stroke of its barbed tendrils, while his glittering blade cut down warriors by the score, his skill beyond anything a mere mortal could hope to match. Yet, there were other stories propagating through the misery, a giant, with eyes like the fires of hell, was fighting across the system too, wherever the resolve of the defending human seemed weakest, this hooded titan of obsidian flesh would appear, the hermit of glorious myth, now made flesh. Where he appeared, the tide of battle turned, his strength and power was unthinkable and wondrous, tanks were ripped apart, entire brigades of narc mad berserker men from Kazan slain by his fists and his flamers, even the howling warriors of the emperor's children felt the brutal exactions of the hermit who killed them like presumptuous bastard children. Eventually, the last of the defenders were pushed back to the blazing ruins of Hades Hive, backlit by endless purple flames, the last of the Steel Legion formed up into a defensive ring, using their chimera as barricades. While their basilisks and russes unleashed a constant barrage of ordnance into the onrushing hordes of madness and despair, Lord Delor, the last of Armageddon's ruling leaders, bedecked himself in the ancient Imperial Guard Navy of his ancestors, his power saber flourishing as he rallied his defenders with an impassioned speech where he called upon his people to put up such a fight, that they would be remembered forever in infamy amongst their enemies, as the last true Imperial outpost. His men cheered bitter cheers, as they shouldered their LAS rifles one last time. Dalor was dragged from his lines as the hordes overran the Chimera blockade, by the brutal lash of Lucius the Eternal, who chuckled with a sadistic arrogance which did not cow Dalor, but drove him into a rage. Lucius dropped the mortal man into the dust at his feet. Both sides paused, as Lucius demanded all to witness the death of hope on Armageddon. Delor, unafraid despite his broken arm and the many cuts ripped into his side by the vicious lash of torment. He spat blood, and slowly raised his saber into a guard position. His arm was shaking with pain, and the defending men, women, and war-haunted children of Armageddon looked on with internal groans of anguish. 
Lucius towered over three meters above the frail, wounded old man who vainly raised his blade to challenge his foe. Lucius smiled a hideous smile, his overly scarred features spitting like the glaze on an old piece of pottery, his fangs and serpentine tongue flicking around his jaws. Dalor attacked with all the skill he could muster, and Lucius lazily blocked and deflected every single blow without even effort. Each time, he would gift Dalor with another shallow cut, and the leader would stumble to his knees, before slowly rising once more. Finally, Lucius split Delor from head to foot with a single stroke of his blade. And so, mankind falls to the eternal blade of the Emperor's children. Never to rise Lucius the Eternal was recorded as cackling across the battlefield, his demonic voice carrying across the entire field easily. There is only one Emperor's child upon this world, and you are not him. I have fought from the shadows for too long. I decree that this shall continue no more. The voice which replied was effortlessly powerful, and filled with a humble yet firm authority which evaporated the effect of Lucius' vile tirade. It is said every warrior on the field that day was briefly knocked into silence for a few moments, as the hermit himself emerged from behind the ranks of the Rand, tossing the abhumans aside as he burst into the forefront of the battle, striding forwards to point at Lucius directly. Lucius turned and cursed the presumption of the pathetic beast who thought to challenge him, drawing his sword once more. His venomous words caught in his throat, as he realized who removed the hooded cloak from around his shoulders, revealing a giant armored and dragon sculptured emerald and glittering green plate, the Primarch, the demigod of war, Vulcan. Though Lucius still rose to a greater height than Vulcan, the Primarch was powerful and filled with a presence the Eternal One couldn't hope to match. Vulcan raised his burning spear in one fist, aimed at the Chaos Marine. Lucius grinned in response. At last, was all the monster said, before charging to engage. The swirling melee lasted for almost 12 hours, demonic energies and light spilling from the conflict in great boiling waves. The arena of conflict which sprang up between the defenders and attackers was turned molten by the fury of the conflict. Vulcan's spear was like a living being in his grasp, darting and spinning to engage Lucius with ever more complex assaults. The Eternal One, for the first time in millennia, was struggling to defend himself and counter-attack, simply trying to defend himself. He however, was simply weeping with joy. At last, a true challenge. Yet, for all Lucius' hateful abilities, Vulcan was the greater. He hacked off the legs of the Chaos Marine, before slicing through his arms from his torso contemptuously. Lucius merely giggled, spewing black blood from his mouth in a great torrent. He jeered at Vulcan, even as the Primarch stood over him. Go on, slay me Salamander Prince. Just like we slew your legion on Istvan, finish your victory, take your bloody vengeance. Feel the pride and joy of avenging your fallen brothers, your fallen Imperium, your broken father. Kill me, and learn of your folly Lucius pleaded, with malevolent eyes. Vulcan slammed his boot down onto Lucius' head. Except, he didn't. His boot paused inches from the killing blow. The arrogance drained from Lucius' face, as Vulcan smiled humorlessly, and turned back to face the hordes of enemies who were ready to murder every defender of Armageddon without mercy. He raised his spear, twirled it in his hand, and plunged it six feet into the ground, before raising his arms up from his sides. He declared his name, what he was and what he represented. He declared how he would rebuild the old Imperium, and drive despair kicking and screaming from his new realm. His speech resounded across the landscape, as his passionate voice reached the men who stood poised to destroy the last remnants of resistance. The Emperor's children however, cared not. They advanced once more, weapons raised, and were then assaulted by the Rand Imperial forces, who threw themselves into combat with the superhuman butchers with rekindled zeal at the words of the Emperor's true child, the Emperor's children. Believing both of their allies had turned, attacked them with spiteful vengeance. The Kazan, Rand and Emperor's children thus turned upon each other, and this conflict expanded out into space and unto every planet in the system. Enemies divided, Vulcan led, at last, a counter-offensive. He battled in person where he could. The few surviving Steel Legion desperately followed him, and as he engaged the enemies across the system, he gathered more and more supporters from the local populace. Those soldiers and people who had hidden from the onslaught of the Astartes now rose up, buoyed by the arrival of their new champion. After a decade of further conflict, Armageddon was reclaimed, and those who opposed Vulcan were forced to withdraw. His howls of hurt pride reverberated throughout the war. Somewhere, deep within a demon world formed from tattooed, mewling flesh, an ancient serpent thing's eyes flicked open, in recognition of the word Vulcan. 
A slow smile spread across its distorted face, as it recalled its brother, but this story will be told later. Vulcan's consolidation of Armageddon ended when he returned to that world, and returned to Hades Hive, at the head of an army of refugees and grizzled soldiers, some Kazan, some Randian, others genuine surviving steel legionnaires and citizens of the planet. Here he found Lucius, howling and cursing. He had been guarded by a dozen soldiers while Vulcan had been at war. They had each shot themselves, as the influence of Lucius corrupted their minds. Still, the Eternal One was alive, limbless and broken, but definitely alive. When Vulcan returned, Lucius cursed and spat his name, eyes wild with malice. I shall never die dog of the Emperor. I am eternal. Even in defeat, I am made stronger. You cannot slay me, or you will fall just like your fallen brothers Lucius cackled manically. Vulcan's face, it was said in later legends, was set like stone as he responded coldly. No, Lucius. You will not die. You will live forever. My subjects, dig a pit, Vulcan requested, as he hefted Lucius up to his eye level. You will live your corruption in darkness and impotence. You shall be eternal, I promise you that, yet. Should you suffocate in your living tomb, and your soul once more seeks reincarnation, know this I take no pride or pleasure in your demise, for you are beneath me. I feel nothing for you. Thus, as Lucius screened his defiant misery through his bleeding jaws, he was entombed within a bladed coffin of Admantium, and was tossed into the vast pit delved into the crust of Armageddon by the adoring allies of Vulcan, before being buried forever. Lucius the Eternal was finally bested, forever. Vulcan turned his attentions inwards, and he remade Armageddon from the foundations up. Militarily secure, the Primarch had the structures of the planet rebuilt. He enforced mass infrastructure renewal projects, including increasing agriculture, both on the surface and in dedicated underground greenhouse vaults. As food and security increased, manpower increased and the population slowly began to recover. He formed enforcer units to keep the peace, had medical facilities and factories constructed, and the people of Armageddon began to prosper over the decades, under their immortal lord's rule, who ruled alongside a council of senators and celebrated thinkers. Eventually, this rebuilding spread to every planet in the system. Once his world was secure and as perfect as his vision could imagine, he began to look outwards. His new armies, forced to utilize the captured budges and warships of the Kazan and Rand, progress was slow. Yet, as he made short warp jumps to the nearest systems, he began to encounter and defeat realms with useful technologies. Knowledge and equipment which he could utilize to reclaim much of the lost information of mankind at its height. He liberated scores of tech priests and their acolytes, bringing them to Armageddon to found the first of Vulcan's Promethean Technocratic Academies. Where the Kelp Mechanicus was reborn upon the world, using the rebuilt factories and industrial equipment of Armageddon, the Academy began to produce many new and glorious technological wonders. After a century of campaigning and reconquest, Vulcan had brought a dozen star systems under his rule, and the academics cloistered within the Tower of Knowledge, situated upon Armageddon, had designed and had constructed three vast battleships, by disassembling dozens of older vessels, and using those parts in conjunction with newly designed equipment. These were soon used to lead the fleets of captured vessels Vulcan had brought under his heel, a million different hulls and weapon loadouts for a million different purposes and wars. Old, disbanded remnants of old Imperial Guard regiments and recruiting worlds also began to be incorporated, adding to the skill and effectiveness of Vulcan's armies. Each world Vulcan took, he would stay upon for almost a decade, carefully rebuilding much of what he destroyed, and converting the populace to his views using his powerful rhetoric and skills as a diplomat and orator. Yet, despite the influence and power of Vulcan, he could not let every fleet of his, and his mortal armies were struggling to advance his new empire, as many other older petty Imperium began to oppose them with ever greater stubbornness. This would not do. As Vulcan's Imperium became better known amongst the galactic population, he began to encounter space marines, in various guises, on the worlds of Domhall, Veska and Hoinkas respectively. Vulcan found these fortress worlds were defended by fearsome defenders, who would not yield to Vulcan's armies. Eventually, Vulcan realized these were Imperial Fists. After much argument and war and debate, the Fists were persuaded that Vulcan was, indeed, who he said he was, and they reluctantly agreed to an alliance, finally relieved after their lengthy sieges. Every few decades, Armageddon would be visited by black-skinned warriors, clad in faded, cracked green armor, tears trailing down their features as they made pilgrimage to Vulcan's residence. 
a relatively mundane tower within the vast rebuilt Hades hive. The surviving salamanders returned to their father. Vulcan joyfully accepted the refugee salamanders into the fold once more. Occasionally, word reached Vulcan's campaign forces of bands of rogue space marines raiding and pillaging various human worlds across the segmentum. When Vulcan actually encountered many of these bands, he discovered most were not actually chaotic renegade marines, but were actually simply rogue gameless starts causing trouble and starting wars simply because they wanted to. Doom Eagles, Marines Malevolent, Dark Star Marine, Minotaurs, White Scars, and a hundred different chapters had elements running rampant and uncontrolled across the void. Vulcan forcibly brought these warbands to battle. Those who did not submit to his imperial rule were defeated and their arms and armor was captured. Those that realized who this Vulcan was, eventually submitted to his will. Yet, despite these recruits and converts, the Vulcan Imperium could only boast around 300 aging as starts, and this was simply not enough to be useful to the ever-expanding realm. By 006 M52, Vulcan's Imperium spanned roughly 1000 worlds. Each world was well fortified, and his army was still expanding and reorganizing into a more unified galactic fighting force. Institutions and bureaucracy sprang up, and many complex industrial and social systems developed turning Armageddon into a bustling metropolis of Vulcan's new Imperio. Not only were the mortal armies changing, but the forces of the Astartes began to be remade according to Vulcan's new plans. He used genetic information from his own flesh, combined with much of the genocide of those Astartes who came to him, to begin a new project of Astartes creation. Countless boys and families begged to join this new revolution of godmaking. These new Astartes were formed into forces known as commanderies, each 2000 marines strong. They were led by veterans of the ancient old Imperium's previous Astartes chapters, who knew of the intensive training required to make these superhumans into true Astartes killing machines. In total, 200 commanderies were formed, and many would be remembered with infamy amongst the foes of Vulcan, the Jade Princes, the Supplicants, Numen Marines, the Dawn Revenants, and countless others which we shall not go into here. Those salamanders who returned to Vulcan formed the first commandery, and kept their title. They devoted themselves to protecting their Primarch. They became a force of guardians and counterinsurgent force, used to stifle any violent revolutions against Vulcan's regimes. However, Vulcan had no desire to crush all dissenters. Those who had concerns over his rule were allowed to have their opinions voiced in the councils of the Vulcan Imperio. While most concerns are ignored, at least they are acknowledged. With the commanderies at the forefront of the reconquest, the Vulcan Imperium expanded to almost 3000 worlds in half the time it took to claim the first 1000. As the Vulcan Imperium expanded, Vulcan encountered the larger menaces that filled the galaxy. South of his realm, the vast theocratic nightmare realm of the Talernophelian Imperium resided. It was a dark realm of suspicion and hatred, where witch hunters and preachers drove the realm into religious mania. The Echelshiarch was the highest authority there, and he declared, from his monolithic cathedral world, that Vulcan was no Primarch, but was instead a demon in disguise. Those that faced the demonic red eyes of the warrior king of the Vulcan Imperium, could hardly deny he seemed truly diabolic, to the north and west of the Vulcan Imperium. The two Chaos Imperiums began to react to his consolidating actions, and many were the vicious wars fought between these three powers. In anticipation of some vast unseen engagement yet to come, to the east, Vulcan received emissaries from a realm he had never known before, Grand Sicarium. The multicolored starts to arrive in Vulcan's court were clad in fine burnish armors, expensive furs and jewelry, and bore ornate bolters across their chests. They declared that King Sicarius, being king of all Astartes, would be happy to accept the commanderies of Vulcan into their empire, as long as they accepted Sicarius as their lord and master. Needless to say, Vulcan was not pleased, and demonstrated great restraint by only killing one of the emissaries of Sicarius, sending the second one back to his master, to inform Sicarius that no, the commanderies would not join his den of infamy and oppression, they would fight them to the very last. 4. Amidst the growing tide of dangers throughout the galaxy, Vulcan had formed a solid core of sanity in the middle of the former Imperium's heart. Additional background section to the greater good drives on. By the dawn of the 61st millennium, the TAU had truly learned their place in the great tumult of the galaxy. Spread across a thousand sectors, and hundreds of September colonies and systems, the TAU were an industrial powerhouse of the like not seen in almost 10,000 years. Their technology had reached beyond what the original TAU, in their naive ignorance, believed was possible. 
and client races by the dozens have integrated into TAU culture with varying degrees of success. The Hustagu visa colonies of Tokin had become almost identical to most September worlds, filled with beautiful white cities and wondrous technologies. While the crude worlds remained semi-civilized auxiliaries, still on the fringes of society despite their ancient pedigree, the furious process of terraforming enacted throughout the second age of strife has worked in their favor. While other cultures faulted and disintegrated, the TAU fashioned themselves into an ever harder force. Their cutting edge weaponry was all inspiring to behold. It was noted during the protracted war with the Zafian Independent Human League and 473 M55, how their newest gunships could move so fast and strike so lethally. Entire battalions of foes were vanquished before the order to retaliate could be given, their armored columns instantly shattered into molten slag by a hundred thousand simultaneous missile barrages. Followed up by direct engagement by agile battlesuits that never seemed to miss. Yet, as we have seen, all this technology was painfully necessary simply for the TAU Meter Empire to survive, in the northern and eastern September clusters of the Empire, and beyond, titanic forces were arrayed against them. A great silver tide threatened to drown them all, and undo their bitterly difficult expansion before it could be completed. The Necrons of the Montgavisa, as they were known by the TAU were at full gold mobilization. Titanic spider constructs bestrode worlds, drinking them dry of life, before spewing green oblivion into their fleets. Endless tides of Necron warriors and immortals lived up to their undying titles. The constructs repaired almost all damage, and those Necrons truly destroyed were ripped from the very air, repaired by a million machines upon their tomb world, and spat back to another war front to fight again, all in the space of ours. In early phases, the TAU lost hundreds of worlds to these terrors, entire planetary populations vanquished before they could be evacuated to safety. Billions died, and the TAU empire wept for these horrendous losses. The water cast propaganda machine had a pitifully easy task uniting their entire empire against this nightmare. Made all the simpler when even the most secure September dwelling, TAU from the safest, most peaceful world only had to look into the sky and notice that stars were vanishing from the skies before their own eyes. For this menace was not some petty dynasty looking for land and a galaxy to rule. It was a force of utter oblivion, led by the personification of such nightmarish ideals, the Nightbringer himself. Many times had the TAU mobilized full battle fleets of the new Avenger class warships and millions of firecast warriors, to fight the Necrons in open war only for a great black cloud to enter the system, and drink the local star dry. This doomed a system, and made defending such places pointless. Many were the solemn poems written at this time upon Elsai, about the terrible agonizing decisions fear maintenance commanders had to face by leaving so-called dark septs to their doom. Yet, by 972 M55, the TAU had somewhat found a method of holding the darkness at arm's length. Munitions were developed that burrowed into Necron constructs, and continually burned no matter how many times they were repaired. This forced tomb worlds to abandon seriously damaged Necrons and to build entire new Necron bodies for the consciousness stored in the nodal grid. This took time, and allowed TAU September colonies to summon aid through the immense way station grid network. When Necron forces transported their swarming monoliths upon a planet or station, they found the TAU were ready with all the fearsome weaponry their empire could fashion. Fighting in such wars, with such hideous and unthinkable powerful weapons was always a harrowing experience. And Earthcast specialist hospitals were set up by the thousands to deal with the influx of battle damage and mentally scarred soldiers evacuated from such war zones. In many cases, these hospitals became euthanasia centers, due to the unnatural and sometimes impossible conditions of some soldiers. The things they saw could not be unseen, and their bodies and minds were consumed by the revelations that gnawed upon their very souls. The TAU had also made a grand alliance with their old foes, the diverse and fickle Fexen trade empire, which had also suffered painfully at the Necron's silvered hands. The concord between the two great rivals was binding so long as the Necrons remained a credible and pressing danger to the survival of the overall galactic community. Little could the two factions realize how many thousands of years this would remain the case. One must also note that though the Thexan elite did sign this treaty, many of their less controllable elements still cause problems in northern September districts, where the rule of the TAU is lax. The Great Necron Wars affected a great many aspects of the Empire throughout its history. There was much desperation amongst the corporate leaders of the Grand Septs such as Tior and Borkan in particular. New weapons and means of combating the Silver Dread were demanded at all times. 
In particular, the dreadful loss of life resulting from the war and attrition rate of almost 80% throughout the year 387M54-999 M57 was widely decried by most non-military elements of the Empire. Borkin made tentative attempts to develop pilotless drone-controlled battlesuits for mass production. However, such machines had slow reactions, and were generally deemed useless, reluctantly. The secret projects which had depopulated the ancient world of Indras were ordered by the Council of Onver to continue their old research into hyper-sophisticated drone processing and development. This led to the terrible events of the Indras conflagration in 555 M57, but we shall come back to this at some future date. However, before that date, the Andrasian cold suits became an essential element in future TAE conflicts, they could be deployed by the millions directly from Demiurg factory vessels, into combat. The distinctive blue-gray form of the Andrasian XV-333-78 combat battlesuits were far more slender and maneuverable than their predecessors due to their lack of a pilot. They could accelerate more quickly and were more agile, as they didn't risk the well-being of their occupants. Also, each suit could contain greater payloads and more weapons and more complex targeting systems, and had extensive sophisticated drone networking systems, allowing drones to become an extension of their own minds. What was more was that rather than being mere programs, the pus of the XV-333s could actually think for themselves, artificial intelligence. A whispered abomination in the old spluttering cultures of the Guvisa, the TAU did not fear these thinking machines. Their arrogance and ignorance would later serve as a warning to all. Beware the ghost and the machine. On 397.893 M54, the single most important development in TAU culture and their wider society came to pass. It was on this day, upon the world of J.A.A. Voral, that a TAU child known to history as Cor Piven, was the first TAU to undergo experimental Earthcast genetic tests. These long and grueling tests had been begun barely 7 character each equivalent to 50 Terran days previously. After reports across the Empire spoke of strange TAU who could perceive the world in a way never before seen, and could even manipulate local physical constants to a minor degree. On some of the more far distant September colonies, such talents would often go unexplored, but the pattern began to reoccur within the more metropolitan September worlds and September dominated colonies. Once the tests were completed, the results were revealed to the Earth cast much to their astonishment. They had confirmed the existence of the first ever TAU Sicker. This information was of course withheld from the majority of TAU society for almost a hundred years. By the time the Ethereals had properly prepared society for this revelation, Viola and several other military academies across the Empire had already performed their own hunts for Sickers or Vortex Singularities as the TAU propaganda machine hurried to call them to. Avoid unpleasant associations with the destructive and insane warp user strains of humanity, who had caused so much destruction of the millennia, and had gathered them together into secret breeding programs. In typical TAU fashion, these sickers began to be developed into a distinct caste, the Emian caste aptly translated as the unforeseen caste, as one could easily argue none amongst the TAU predicted such a development, clad in strange purple robes, and utilizing odd energy focusing crystals in their ornamentation and armaments, these figures became a strange and unsettling presence within TAU society. Most were hastily deployed to the Eternal Necron Front, bolstering the other psychic races of the Grand Alliance, which were essential in keeping the Silver Menace at bay. The rest were used by the Ethereals, to ensure the compliance and adoration of September worlds and those living within them, to the greater good. The M. Yenva were the perfect tools for the Ethereals to enact their dominion over all living being beneath their united facade and dissidents would give themselves away simply by thinking against the system. Such dissidents were taken from their homes and taken to re-education centers, where a combination of Imyen hypnosis techniques and powerful chemical olfactory were employed to realign the loyalties of the discordant elements. They returned to their home world speaking of the beautiful verdant lands they had visited, and how they had spoken personally to Ornva, who told them the true meaning of the greater good. So far, not one of the re-educated citizens of the Empire has ever been known to re-offend. Such is the destiny of unity. On the western borders of the TAU Meter Empire, things are rather different. Throughout this period, growing mobilization on the eastern borders meant the TAU could not afford to supply these colonies and distant septs with the latest technology and weaponry. On some worlds, they were even still using old Devilfish chassis and gunship variants, as well as the old battlesuit designs. 
These colonies shared greater trading and cross-cultural exchange with outside societies than the very insular inner colonies of the empire. Numerous human imperiums and civilizations trading ideas and technology with these colonies, or, more often, would raid or make war upon these weaker TAU societies, thinking they were unable to defend themselves. Sometimes this was accurate, most of the time it was not. Many were the foolish brigand captains who, clad in their stolen finery and armed with pillage vessels, sought to blast the TAU into submission. TAU railguns and hero class cruisers often demonstrated with defined clarity just who was the real power in the area. The semi-independent enclave known as the far-sighted enclave, is a rare example of a truly independent TAU civilization, completely distinct from their authoritarian neighbors. It is a bizarre feudal culture centered around archaic battlesuit wearing Khaza princes, who maintain personal armies and vie with one another for influence. Theirs is a bastard culture of many different origins, which can only really unite when under threat by a faction more powerful than all of the princes combined. Such a foe reared its head in 222 M53. In this year, the outer way stations of the Enclave picked up the distinctive signature of a large battle fleet entering real space from the war. Accordingly, Keska Sekoilgu, the local Kaza prince, gathered his forces and his battle fleet and thundered to intercept this fleet. Over the moon of Jabza, the two fleets met. The enemy fleet didn't even attempt to communicate with Koilgu. Instead, the vast fleet of boxy, bulky vessels, each distinctive and colorful in its livery and decoration, opened fire upon Koilgu's armada. The battle raged for days, until the flagship of the mysterious fleet fired boarding torpedoes directly into Koilgu's own command vessel. The enclave TAU fought hard with pulse rifle and bloody minded determination, but they were easily cut down by the arrogant giants who rampaged through the ship. Accompanied by flocks of adoring human worshippers who fired lasguns and cried prayers to their masters. Eventually, the leader of the foe burst onto Koilgu's bridge. Koilgu was armored in a beautifully maintained battlesuit, covered in honor markings and inscriptions of glory. Before him, God Captain Fligren, a starts under lord for the 17th crusade of Grand Sicarium stood in ornate power armor with glittering power fist, his shoulders swathed in a thick lion pelt his head covered by ostentatious jewelry of the most garish kind. The two opulent and corrupt figures stared each other down for but an instant before the charged. Bolter and Melter raged against plasma rifle and burst cannon. Crackling power fist clattered against a sparking mechanicus power glaive, granted to Koilgu by a captured adept long ago. Though the battlesuit made Koilgu fiendishly strong, Fliegren was a veteran of almost a millennia of bloodshed and warfare. His skill was phenomenal and the duel ended which the psychotic marine carving opened Koilgu's chassis, before having his sycophantic minions pour molten gold inside the suit with the screaming TAU still inside. Koilgu's gilded corpse was delivered to the Grand Kassar of the Enclave scant months later. The retainer who brought the grisly trophy to the Kassar arrogantly recited the god captain's message. Here is a valuable gift to the great Kassar of the far-sighted Enclave, a token of the benevolence of Lord King Sicarius and the Grand Sicarium. You shall receive more of these mighty gifts, should your foolish peoples choose to oppose the dominion of the true master of the galaxy, and the king of all the starts. Needless to say, but the remains of the retainer, after the Kassar was done with him, would have barely filled a small paper cup. The challenge of Fliegren had been accepted, and it would be many years before his crusade could be stopped by the Enclave. Over a dozen worlds and a hundred battlefronts, the insane marines of Grand Sicarium and their men-at-arms fought bitter world-to-world -world wars with the Enclaves. Each side fought like smoke, fluidly attempting to outmaneuver their opponents before delivering a killing blow. Guerrilla campaigns were launched by desperate or hate-fueled enclavers, and the Astartes responded with vast bombing runs over civilian population centers. The sheer number and variety of conflicts that raged for decades throughout the lawless border regions could fill a library themselves, but eventually both sides were exhausted. Numbers dwindling to but a fraction of their previous forces. Bitter and driven by a blinding arrogance, Fliegren continued his campaign, initiating a blistering and penetrative offensive with his remaining fleet, which plunged like a spear deep into the soft tissue of the far-sighted enclave. The capital world itself was besieged by two great battle barges. These massive floating cityscapes were almost impossible to destroy. Time and again dedicated bands of battlesuits and drones would sally forth on covert missions to infiltrate and destroy the colossi, but to no avail. Then, something truly disastrous occurred. In his hubris and mania, Fliegren had neglected to maintain his stocks of ordnance throughout the war. His logistical lines were stretched to breaking point, and this breaking point came 16 months into the final siege. 
a vast astart supply vessel, the Bride of Sicarius, burst into the system without escort. Hoping to resupply the vast barges who had been constantly pounding any large cities or settlements they could find upon the surface. Before it could reach Fleegrim's vessels however, the Cass's men finally leapt into action. Over 700 battlesuits, 300 orcas filled with loyal fire warriors, supported by a tribe of the mercenary crew, boarded the vessel, and destroyed all the munitions in a great storm of gunfire and scream. Now helpless and unarmed, the battle barges were easier meat for the reinforcements that came to wreak their terrible vengeance upon the hated Astartes. Khazar princes from across the enclave burst into the system with their attendant fleets, spewing glistening arcs of blue and purple energy into the stricken behemoths. Missiles and iron batteries of a dozen different configurations and designs pump their destructive force into breaking apart the ancient Terran constructs. Armor plates splintered and blistered, men and women howled as the void reached in to snatch away their lives in a fiery instant, and slowly but surely, both the great ships collapsed under the pressure, tumbling into pieces like the decomposing corpses of whales. It was said Fleegren went down with his ship, insanely ordering his men to stop dying, as the air was sucked from the bridge. He died hacking apart his own minions as they asphyxiated on the floor at his gilded boots. This is, of course, but a brief glimpse into the actions of the TAU of this period, as destiny called out to all races in the wake of building giants in both the void and the warp. Soon enough, the TAU, the young race turned into a cynical monstrosity by grief, were forced to reassess their place in the galaxy, and to choose a side in the final great and enduring conflict of our, and indeed all, times. For it was coming, and no dynasty would be secure from it in the end. Additional background section 3 The Asur Revenant The Actions of the Elder. It would be remiss of this history to ignore one of the prime movers throughout the Eternal War. By the close of the Second Age of Strife, to an outside observer, the Elder Race would have seemed utterly extinct, save for those last few burning embers. Indeed, most of the vast craft worlds were naught but ghost ships, rumbling silently with the souls of the countless dead Elder slain in the hopeless task of awakening their god of the dead while others were victims of the great chaos empires and necron uprisings in the ascent throughout that darkest of times. Of the craft worlders, only Bealtan remained active and defiant, attracting those few outsiders and rogues of their race to them, and forging a moderate empire of hundreds of worlds though these remained scattered across the galaxy, thus making their empire seem impossibly diffuse and hard to notice. Yet, this is but a fragment of the Elder Race in total, for, running through the veins of the webway like Black Tar was a realm which had never stopped, and never repented of their actions. Kamorag. The Second Age of Strife had a different name in the Dark City of Sin. It had been considered a Golden Age. With the fall of the Imperium, all order vanished and collapsed. Once secure worlds across the galaxy were now helpless before the Dark Kin and their ever-draining souls. Worlds were repeatedly ravaged by the Dark Elder Cabals. Slave souls and tortured screams filled the city in a great tumult, yet, for all their building prosperity, the drain upon their own gangrenous souls grew too. Their raids were ever more frequent as the coiling embrace of Slanesh tightened as her power built in the anarchy of the wider galaxy. The Dark Elder continued on as they had always done, driven by insanity and malice and utter evil. They continued to conspire against one another and the dark pits were ever filled with the shrieks of the damned and the dying. And at the center of all this, was Astrubial Vect. The overlord of Kamorag, however, was truly mad. One of the eldest beings alive, the Dark Lord's life drew on long beyond his ability to rejuvenate his soul. Millions upon millions of slaves and minions had to perish every day to keep his soul from being drained away like bile in rainwater. He grew desperate and ever more dangerous as his mind began to slip from him. To begin with, this mania was merely a deception, a lure to draw out conspirators against his position. But after thousands of years, deception became truth, and Vect became something far worse than a monster and a tyrant to the Dark Elder. He became a liability and a threat to all Archons. Cabals who didn't bring back sufficient souls were destroyed as they entered the port of lost souls, and their ruins were picked over by the parched and rival Archons alike. His punishments for perceived slights and threats against him were brutal even by his own standards. Some Archons were carved up into a thousand parts, regrown through the oceans of agony generated by the Hemonculi, and each one was then butchered and tortured, before being deposited upon Slanashi Demon Worlds. Yet, there was but one Archon who could hope to challenge Vect's entrenched position, Lady Males. Disgruntled Cabals flocked to her banner secretly and the old noble houses slithered to her throne with tributes of the caged screams of billions of wailing infants in the hearts of an entire race made extinct in her name, 
and it was not just they who had her ear. The Holocrans, it was rumored, came secretly to her chambers, and danced the secret dances that nobody knew. Secrets and prophecies and words uttered only once and never uttered in all the countless eons of existence before or since. The rumors of bladed shadows that descended upon worlds assailed by the Nightbringers forces during the Eastern campaigns are perhaps not so far-fetched as once believed, but this is another story. Yet the Dark Lord was not without his own allies, his sycophants and those Dark Elder who truly wished to see the galaxy sicken and misery to reign, simply to see what would happen, and how it could be rebuilt in a vile manner of their own choosing. At every level of the twisted hierarchies of Kimorag, a new division was brewing, amidst the various and multifaceted feuds and ambition which was normal and encouraged across the twisted realm. Of course, to the outside galaxy, this was an unseen war, but it was not unnoticed. The Dark Elder were being bred on an unprecedented scale, and the Hemonkili rejoiced as they could breed more eventual fodder for their labs. Abominations were released on millions of worlds across the galaxy, and no one could comprehend what these misshapen things were, or why they so desperately tortured, raped and destroyed them. Raids became even more frequent, as the raw material that formed Kimorag's bedrock was in ever greater demand. While ambition brewed in the Dark City, the rest of the Elder Race was not idle. Beeltan engaged in a war against the Eastern Chaos Imperium. The realm of renegades and brigands was vast, bordering both Vulcan's new Imperium and the western domains of Abaddon himself. Yet, it was a cumbersome beast, with little order beyond the great fleets of Huron Blackheart, the rotting heart of the Chaos Imperium. The war was predominantly a naval conflict, as the Elder made up for their lack of numbers by using waystones and spirit gems to guide and control control the massive numbers of orphaned craft world fleets. Greatly bolstering the numbers available to Iriel. Iriel was a genius in void warfare, yet Huron, despite his age and his increasing chaotic taint, was also a master of fleets. There were far too many naval actions, spread across centuries upon centuries, to document in their entirety here, for Iriel was a persistent threat and nuisance to Huron. His ships were arrow swift and they only fought battles when they had no other choice. Most of the time, they avoided his great corsair armadas. When they did strike, it was while Huron's armies were occupied in other wars against lesser imperiums and against Abaddon and his legions or the Astartes commanderies of Vulcan. Whenever Huron was weakest, Ariel struck. It is testament to the skill of Huron and his lieutenants that these battles were rarely one-sided, they always knew of some means to reply to the Elder. Indeed, Huron's familiar whispered of coming threats weeks before they arrived. One such battle was in the system of Mana Forge, where Ariel came close to being destroyed. The world was a dark Mechanicus Forge world, a world infested with the Obliterator Plague right to its very core. Huron's vessels, limping back to an allied port after a failed campaign against the Lead Bastion, one of Grand Sicarium's core worlds, were attacked by Ariel's hidden Void Stalkers, cruisers and wraith ships as they burst into reality. Like daggers through silk, the Elder engaged the chaotic vessels, laying waste to hundreds of vessels within hours. But Huron had picked the Manaforge for a very particular reason. He had made a pact with the deep entity known as Volchoch the Maker, the Ravager of Terror, Lord of the Obliterator Contagion. These great demon was promised all of Manaforge, as well as the sanctified sacrifices of 200 betrayed Red Corsairs. But what really sealed the pact was the promise of bright Elder Souls to devour. Elder were so very rare, and it would please Volchoch to deny the young upstart god Slanesh some of her prized delicacies. When Ariel destroyed the first wave of Chaos vessels, he sealed the deal, and Mana Forge opened. Volchoch and his ilk were demons from the Deep Warp, ancient and vast beyond all imagining. When he was reborn upon the plane of flesh, he bodily possessed all of the wrecked hulks at once. Vines of sulfurous demon flesh and churning technologies flowed between the ruins, knitting them together into an behemoth as vast as a star fort. Huron eventually arrived hours later, and the battle of Manaforge began anew. Both sides were heavily battered and brutalized and not one vessel escaped unscathed. Ariel's flagship was almost consumed by a great destroyer wide maw which burst from Volchoch's stolen flesh of steel and souls. But skillful piloting in the Spear of Twilight spared him of this end. Another engagement in the long war led the two enemies to almost be destroyed by a third force, when they became becalmed in the dead warp around the Angle world of Zone. Their engines failed and their crews became sluggish and weak, as the cold influence of the perfectly symmetrical world of order and obedience spread out from it like a vile halo. Luckily, they managed to repair their vessels just as their sensors picked up the great silver pinions of the Angles of the Starfather, come to break their spirit and enslave their minds. Beeltan would never bow, 
The hollow carcasses that were once the craft were all echoed with the sounds of skirmishing and violence. Bands of looters and pirates attempted to ransack these ancient world ships for their hidden technologies and the secrets that lay within them. They often learned too late that the capering ones in their cloaks of many colors still defended their kin's graves. And yet, craft world after craft world were pillaged by some great force, which could evade the defenders easily. They did not cause damage though, and they only took one thing. Each craft world found their avatars spirited away. Only gory offerings and broken spirit stones marked their passing. When the War of Kimorak finally came in M67, there was carnage which will be detailed further in later parts. Yet, soon, the two rivals found that a far greater war had come to the galaxy, and for once, they could not hide from it, for it came for them. The full extent of this war will become apparent in later sections, but the Dark Elder experienced their first real taste of this conflict when the Great Jackal God began, in earnest, his war upon the Webway. Though the Deceiver had little power there, the Greater War had begun to awaken his more esoteric allies from their slumber in prism and banishment. The Ophelim Kyasos, that great and knowable terror, had dimensions that bisected the webway in certain sections. What is more, it had allies amongst the Dark Elder themselves, creatures that had bonded themselves to the anomaly through some means mortals were not meant to know. The Dark Kin would fight in the war for existence, or they too would perish. And of course, all true elder grew to fear and despise those who rose from the crone world, those who were her favorites, brought back to drink deep of the fall of flesh and the accent of excess. The chaos elder, who would attempt to bring the galaxy to its knees, at the head of the impossible legions that gathered for the end. So I've recently moved Ikbadia merch over to Teesprings and have a few new designs. Listings are below the video and in the description. So I am an affiliate of NordVPN. If you have been thinking of getting a VPN with everything going on at the minute NordVPN is offering 75% off a 3 year plan. I have been using Nor myself for a few years now because it helps support a lot of the people I like to watch on YouTube and I think it's pretty cool they have let me become an affiliate. So check out norvpn.org forward slash nickbeardia and use coupon code nickbeardia for 75% off while the offer is on. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! What the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services. It's time to stop!